example of uh, an officer was giving me my performance review and I had like phenomenal ratings, like top officer, but he kept the door open and I was like, why are you keeping the door open? And he's like, oh, you just never know. And I was like, what do you mean you never know? Like, you know, and I realized like he was well-intentioned, like thought I was a great officer, but was also kind of saying like at any point you could ruin my career, which I think is really unfortunate because that is not the message that people should, you know, be getting that women are just, you know, um, uh, really dangerous. And if you interact with them, it's dangerous because that, um, you know, makes mentorship really difficult. How can corporate leaders make compliance training entertaining enough that their employees will pay attention? How do you know if compliance training is effective? And what has a founder in this space learned about building for and selling to HR and legal? Today, I am joined on The Abstract by Roxanne Petraeus, co-founder and CEO of Athena, which is an all-in-one compliance training platform. Before starting Athena, Roxanne was a consultant at McKinsey and Company. This is her second startup. She previously started an online marketplace for chefs. She actually began her career in the U.S. Army, where she spent a year deployed as an engineer officer in Afghanistan and four years as a civil affairs officer with multiple deployments to the Pacific. Roxanne, thanks so much for joining me for this episode of The Abstract. Thanks for having me. Uh, you actually have a pretty different starting place in your career than most of my guests. You served in the army. Totally. Uh, can you start by telling us a little bit about what inspired you to serve in the military? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, not the most common founder, um, background though, uh, occasionally <laughs> I had, um, bump into other people, um, with military backgrounds in tech and it's always really fun because it's a small group, but a very supportive group. Yeah. So I, um, I did something called ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps, which essentially pays for college in exchange for um, for doing service. And I'll say that the reason I joined is not particularly high minded. Like I, I wish I could say it was, but you know, it's like you're a teenager. What do you really know about uh, the world? Um, so I had gotten into Harvard, was really excited about it, and didn't have the money to pay for it. It was like pretty simple. Mm, yeah. So I learned about this thing called ROTC and um, both of my parents had served in um, the military uh, for short periods of time. So I, I, I at least had some familiarity with it, even though it was um, largely before I was even born. And so I just thought like, okay, maybe I'll try it. And if worst case scenario, I get a year of college paid for, I quit, you know, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But I just ended up really liking it. I liked the people. I liked the leadership. I felt like it was just kind of this group of people that I kind of wanted to be when I grew up. Um, I thought that the yeah. training was phenomenal and it just kind of felt like a place where I could, um, yeah, just like become a better version of myself as, as corny as it is. And so while yeah. I sort of joined for reasons that were kind of more about just like solving an immediate problem in front of me, I ended up staying <laughs> because, um, I just, I just thought the people were, uh, by and large, like phenomenal. I thought I could learn a lot and, um, I also thought, you know, it's like the recruiting posters, but kind of like see the world um, kind of thing. I was like, you know, this is uh -huh. a time with the we're at war. Um, and it just sort of felt like I uh, would, my like eyes would really be open to this like world that I otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't really see. And I mean, you did see some interesting places, yeah. uh, Afghanistan being one. I, I know you had different you were deployed to different parts of the Pacific. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those those deployments and and uh, what that experience was was like? Yeah, I um, deployed to Afghanistan while the the conflict was still going on, and it's like I find it a little hard to summarize it in like one pithy statement. It was just so many sure. different things. It's like geographically, the country is just stunning. Like it's just like beautiful and. Um, kind of looks, I grew up in Florida. It's like flat and hot and Afghanistan has these like mountain <laughs> ranges and these like fertile valleys. And you're just like, you know, it, it, it truly feels like a different world. Obviously it's like also a world that looks really different just in terms of like the people, the culture. It was like, wow, like, you know, I have never seen um, like kind of a society like this. And then like overlay all of that, the fact that there's like an active ground war going on. And that was just pretty wild to sure. see um, U S forces, um, international forces, um, like Taliban, um, like, uh, the sort of security, like outsourced security form firms. And it was just, I don't know. I feel like I kind of walked around with like, um, like, uh, deer in the headlights, like just looking around at all the different wild sort of things that were going on. 
Um, and it was like really informative and I think took a long time to process and to think about and obviously has been like, you know, uh, I think that was like diplomatic way to say it. it was like certainly wasn't um, a phenomenal success, like um, in terms of like mm-hmm. what uh, foreign policy looks like. But in terms of like being able to see like just, I don't know, humanity at an extreme, like it was it was absolutely that. Deer in the headlights. Uh, do you feel like there are aspects of that experience in the military that prepared you well to be a founder of your own company or, or I mean more to, I guess to the point, like do you feel like there are lessons from that time that you still draw on today now that you've started a business? Totally. I think, you know, they're often like not necessarily the kind of taught in classroom lessons. They're more these like um, sort of mental images I have of like, I can think of um, the base I was on got a lot of indirect fire. Uh, so like mortars and things. And I just remember this one officer who was like really always very like cool and calm and collected about it. And I was like, that's just like, kind of, you realize like, you kind of want to follow someone like that. You're like, I don't know. They seem like they're just kind of <laughs> like, they're going to figure this out and it's going to be okay. And I think a lot about like um, how really great leaders can kind of turn the, down the temperature in a room because like, mm-hmm. you know, um, you don't do great decision-making under extreme stress. Like you know, very few people make great decisions when they're panicking and flailing. Like it's just, it's not confidence inspiring. And so of course my um, role now as a co-founder and CEO in no way has the physical danger that um, accompanied something mm-hmm. like Afghanistan. It still absolutely has stress, right? There are, um, you have customers, you're trying to win big deals, like you have fundraising and all of those can be really stressful moments. And um, in those, I try to remember some of the great leaders that I saw and how they just kind of navigated hard situations by somehow turning the temperature down. What was it that inspired you to start uh, Athena? I mean, I'm really, I'm curious, you know, one, deciding, okay, I'm going to take the leap. I'm going to start my, I'm going to, you know, leave McKinsey behind. I'm going to start my own business. Um, but two, like why, why in compliance? What, what about this did you feel like was a space that, that, um, you needed to bring sort of your perspective to? Yeah, I knew very little about the compliance space. And instead I just had a really strong perspective (laughs) on, um, one really, really like this small, relatively small sliver of it, which is as harassment. So in the army, there's a woman, um, and the army was like, I don't know, you know, 80% men, something like that. And like, uh-huh. there's just been a lot of documentation about, um, it's an institution that like has definitely not, um, uh, not always like flawlessly, um, handled gender integration. I mean, to the point that, you know, it's also a very recent sure. issue. Like, um, when I joined the army, um, certain roles were still just, um, close to women. So it's not even just the cultural <laughs> exclusion. There was just, you know, sort of straight up women can't do X, Y, or Z. And so I think being in a world like that was like, you know, just taught me a lot about, um, like gender dynamics, sexual harassment, and then, um, also seeing training that just felt really bad, felt like it, if anything, made the whole situation worse. Like it would have just been better not to have done the training um, because it was so bad. It was cheesy. It was corny. It was the sort of like butt (laughs) of jokes, you know, it was, um, it, it made soldiers sometimes feel like I have this um, example of uh, an officer was giving me my performance review and I had like phenomenal ratings, like top officer, but he kept the door open and I was like, why are you keeping the door open? And he's like, well, you just never know. And I was like, what do you mean you never know? Like, (laughs) you know, and I realized like he was well-intentioned, like thought I was a great officer, but was also kind of saying like at any point you could ruin my career, which I think is really unfortunate because that is not the message that people should, you know, be getting that women are just, you know, um, uh, really dangerous. And if you interact with them, it's dangerous because that, um, you know, makes mentorship really difficult. And so long way of saying, I didn't necessarily have a perspective on compliance training because it's not something I knew a lot about, but I did have a perspective on how you could um, make sure that like your whole team to include women could um, participate effectively at work and also what, you know, caused mm-hmm. them to leave or caused them to like not, um, uh, not be able to be like full team members. And so that was the particular insight. And then it ended up turn, turns out being very applicable to the space more broadly. But um, at the beginning, I just saw this one specific issue. That's interesting. And then, you know, you, as people will learn if they go to Athena's website and, and look around and explore, right, it's expanded sort of totally. well beyond that to a whole host of different areas. Um, 
I actually think that engaging content around compliance training is super important. Yeah. Uh, that it just won't resonate. Like, in some ways, it's actually a content issue. It's just as much a content issue in my mind as a tech issue. Yeah. Um, having done you know privacy trainings or security trainings, given them and received them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, how do you scale that up, though? And, and, and how do you think about getting that right across what really is a very diverse set of issues, right? I mean, totally. Assessment training, which you're referring to, is quite different than how do we make sure you don't fall, you know, victim to a phishing scam? Totally. I think that's true. But I think there are also, so like even your point around tech versus content, um, we uh-huh. think of them as incredibly related. So for example, <laughs> if you have very bad tech, what you have to do if you're doing online learning is you send everybody the same 60 minutes because it's just too difficult right. to send a particular scenario to just your sales team because you're like, I don't know how to track this. And so like, you know what? I don't really care that not all of this information, whether it's code of conduct, privacy, doesn't really matter. I don't care if it's relevant to everybody. Sure. Everyone's getting it because I just can't figure out how to deal with it. <laughs> um, whereas if you have really good tech, which like is what um, uh, we built, you can do things um, that that make the content really good. So it's around personalization, adaptive learning, but even just like the very basic thing is personalization. So you might think that like only a small group um, at your company is likely interacting with government officials, if anybody. Those are the only people right. who probably need you know training on how to um, sort of appropriately interact with government officials. Uh, mm-hmm. And and I think it's like a bit of a of course internal company risk tolerance um, perspective, but I think that and the best companies. Um, we work with who um, take just like such a thoughtful approach to designing the curriculum and realizing like, yeah, I guess technically like so-and-so in the HR department might accidentally someday stumble into like an interaction with, you know, a Malaysian ambassador, but like <laughs> probably not, you know, instead it's probably going to be like our enterprise sales team and in particular the ones who sell yep. the government. And so therefore I'm just going to send this particular module just to them. Um, and I think that that, while it might seem not revolutionary, what it does is it cuts down on training time for everybody else, because you have to be realistic that everyone is incredibly busy. And so if you say, I'm going to train to the time, as opposed to training to the standard, people tune out, like, you know, it's a, I feel like the best tech companies say this, like your competition isn't your competitors, it's Netflix, it's email, it's, you know, right. um, <laughs> it's like, I don't know, Instagram, <laughs> like, that's where your employees when they're bored are going to be. So we just try to think about how you can be as punchy and effective as possible in short periods of time, and really marry the tech to that. So it can be personalized, it can, you know, um, be really clever, um, in terms of like, when um, employees are interacting mm-hmm. with it. I'm sure you've talked to a lot of, whether they're GCs or head of HR or learning and development folks, uh, what, what have you, um, compliance officers uh, who haven't adopted a tech solution, who are still sort of, you know, building their own decks or tracking these sorts of things in Excel. Outside of the advantages that come with tech, you know, what are the things that you think companies are getting wrong when they're doing this in house? Like, what, what what's the lowest hanging fruit for making a fix besides a subscription? <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah. And like, I'll say, I'm actually a huge fan of like live instructor led training. Like, I think it's phenomenal. Mm. Uh-huh. Um, and I don't in any way want to like. Um, I think that um, our job is more to like augment and to make things scalable. So, like the companies you know that we tend to work with. They may still be doing some in-person training. I think it's the best way to do things like, you know, um, uh, let let your employees ask questions, right? Like that's that's just like a yeah. really like, hey, I saw this thing and like, I don't know. Um, phenomenal use of in-person time. I think like there's a bunch of things that make it really hard to do in-house and it really depends on like how fleshed out your legal team is. One very basic one is just keeping up with all the new regulations. So like um, uh, I think July sure. 1st was the first um, uh, was the training deadline for this new California workplace violence prevention training. If you mm-hmm. have infinite resources, I guess, sure, like keep up with the laws and make the training and, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but usually what I hear is like, hey, I think I'm really um, phenomenal at like um, you know, certain parts of my job. And I don't, I don't want to be the, um, like just a constant, like training, uh, cranking out training, like, um, all types. And so we, we try to say like, okay, then, you know, use us for the stuff that maybe the regulations change frequently, um, or whatever. And, and then you can spend your, um, you know, sort of like time on more like high value activities. That might be one. That makes sense. Um, how do you feel like if, if you're an HR leader or you're a legal leader, you roll out training, 
how do you know if it's successful, right? Like, like are there metrics that you think yeah. the company should be tracking? What does success often look like besides, let's say, like, you know, not getting bribed by a government <laughs> official or lower, well, I don't know about reporting, right? Because that's, a, but like lower rates of, let's say, like in the workplace or that sort of thing like, like oh, what does like, success look like usually okay i wish i had a snappy like it's these three metrics and watch them like a hawk <laughs> and that's how you but i actually think even what you just said where you started to be like well wait i guess if reporting went down that could be like a problem and you're like yeah like yeah. as a company like you might say like we had no incidents as an example last year and the mm-hmm. gcs i talk with who are really smart say like and that concerns me because i just don't think that's statistically likely and so what I actually right. think might be happening is that either managers don't know, um, they don't recognize that what they're seeing is is um, some sort of a problem, employees aren't comfortable reporting it, like whatever it is. Um, and so it is actually really messy. So um, uh, when we talk to our customers, we talk about like a mix of the quantitative and the qualitative. So the quantitative mm-hmm. is, you know, um, in our training, for example, every five minutes, employees can rate the training. So like Yelp or something. And we surface those insights back to each particular customer. So, you know, company A knows like, here's what your employees thought of X, Y, or Z. That's mm-hmm. one really helpful data point um, uh, is like what employees are saying. But another one is very much more the qualitative. Um, so it's like if you have HRBPs or um, compliance ambassadors, mm-hmm. And they're out there just having conversations. They're surfacing those insights usually back to the team. And that might be something like, I I think of this example because it was just really powerful. We had a customer a while ago who said, hey, um, I just want to thank you. The training that you all had on the um, like harassment um, and discrimination by third party by vendors, that training was really useful. And we're like, oh, amazing. How Uh do you know it was useful? They said, oh, well, we actually had um, someone on our team who was having issues with a vendor, but she didn't realize that we as a company are responsible, like that matters too. It's not just like, oh, because it's not your team member. It's sort of, don't bring it to legal. We can't really do anything about it. And, but after she took her Athena training, she, you know, realized that like, yeah, this is, this is inappropriate, even if it's a vendor um, or a client or someone like that. And so she brought the issue to us. And when we asked her why she brought the issue, you know, she said, I just took Athena training and here's, here's what I learned. And so I think it's like a bunch of those things. I am really excited that about a year ago, we rolled out a um, employee hotline, you know, so anonymous or attributed an employee can raise an issue. And then a case management tool where, for example, mm-hmm. an HRBP might just say like, you know, um, oh, uh, like whatever, Joe raised this issue and like, it's not an investigation yet, but like, I just want to keep an eye on it because if I hear a couple other things about this team or this manager, it might tell me there's something going on. And I think the real right. like exciting um, place is uh, when you kind of marry the training data with the hotline, the the feedback, because training is kind of mm-hmm. talking to a company, talking to your employees, but the the hotline tool is listening to them. And I think it gets very interesting when you kind of have both directions going versus just yeah. one. Yeah. It's interesting to me that this sort of training that it seems to get done or that it seems to be easy to get budget for internally. Um often is the training that I think that people, unfortunately, that that, that doesn't always resonate with them, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the data security training, and then they go through it. And everyone's had that experience, which you've referred to, you know, of like, in around the water cooler, proverbial water cooler, let's say in the startup kitchen. (laughs) You know, that was such a waste of time. I had my headphones (laughs) running, and I was like sending emails the whole time totally through it. Um, As you talk to GCs, head of HR, etc, like, how do they get budget for going beyond that? Let's say, right? Like, is that ever a sort of objection? Um, and and how do, how have you seen customers or clients deal with that when they say, you know, like really, actually, we should be investing in in much higher quality stuff. This isn't just a check the box exercise. Yeah, I think it's certainly like you know, budgets always um, an issue. But I also have noticed a couple of things. So one is, um companies that um, uh, tend to be like larger and therefore have more scrutiny, like as soon as Mm -hmm. there has been some sort of regulatory issue, so like a consent decree or, you know, whatever it was, I think the conversation really flips and there's this recognition of like, Uh, oh, that was a X million dollar experience. And even if they haven't bought into training as being like a proactive response to it, um, to like, you know, actually minimizing the likelihood of sort of data privacy issues, for example, they recognize mm-hmm. that just the benefit of loan to demonstrating to a regulator that they've taken something seriously, that alone is like, yes. you know, the unlock. 
another area where we've seen um, like success at sort of getting budget is um, leaders hate when they feel like their teams are wasting their time, right? Like you talk to a sales leader or an engineering mm-hmm. leader, that's being the best examples. And like, man, do they get fired up if they're like, why did you take my people sort of like off the line for, you know, hours and you wasted their time? <laughs> and so- uh-huh. Like another um, pitch that's been really effective is like, actually, you can kind of like dramatically reduce seat time while actually driving up effectiveness if you do all of these things. So like test out options, adaptive learning, or even just role-based training. Mm -hmm. Um, And Mm -hmm. so like, you know, when you think about like how expensive it is to make a whole company go through four hours a year of of training, like, you know, it, it does add up. So that's another way I've seen people kind of make the budget case to leadership. And often um, it's actually leadership and it's coming to HR compliance and just saying like, this is absurd. Like we've got so much training. It is a very yeah. variable quality. It's coming out all through the year. No one is clear what they are and aren't supposed to do. It feels really repetitive. Like, didn't we just take cyber training and now we're doing it again? Right. Um, like, I don't get it. And like, how many times do you have to tell me not to click something? And so, for example, (laughs) we like released a phishing simulator. And so instead, it's Uh like you are getting trained because you clicked the thing. (laughs) And then people get a little less like fired up about it. Um, Yeah. So that's that's another um, the sort of like quantity quality trade off. The abstract is brought to you by SpotDraft, an end to end contract lifecycle management system that helps high performing legal teams become 10 times more efficient. If you spend hours every week drafting and reviewing contracts, worrying about being blindsided by renewals, or if you just want to streamline your contracting processes, SpotDraft is the right solution for you. From creating and managing templates and workflows, to tracking approvals, e-signing, and reporting via an AI-powered repository, SpotDraft helps you in every stage of your contracting. And because it should work where you work, it integrates with all the tools your business already uses. SpotDraft is the key that unlocks the potential of your legal team. Make your contracting easier today at SpotDraft.com. Are you seeing any trends around compliance training or a sort of evolution around this? Like, are there things that you're seeing broadly trained on? I've seen folks broadly trained on today that maybe you weren't seeing a few years ago. What, totally. is, what does that landscape look like? Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, there's certainly always trends in terms of like, um, someone described to me the DOJ guidance on training is like someone trying to read, you know, like the Oracle, like what's the Oracle saying? And so, you know, the recent <laughs> updates, I think a lot of our customers really care about that. But, you know, that Uh really comes down to like, um, you know, uh, training that's effective, training that's role-based, training that's very specific to scenarios that have happened at your company. Um, And Mm -hmm. so one of the things that we see a lot of interest in is customizing training. So we support a company taking our data privacy training and making it your data privacy training. And it doesn't have to be um, a very elaborate uh, endeavor. It could just be like your, um, you know, privacy council gets uh, three scenarios that are like anonymized based on stuff that actually happened at your company. And they put that into the training. And that's so much more effective than just generic, like be thoughtful about user data, which everyone is like, I'm never intending to be not thoughtful about it. But what I haven't put two and two together with is like, Oh, screen sharing with like someone who doesn't need to see this like user dashboard. Like, okay. Like I hadn't, I hadn't realized like why that might be a problem. So that's one. Then on topics, I've seen two recently. One is uh, surprisingly like AI and compliance. So, and what I'm really mm-hmm. hearing is that our legal um, customers in particular, they're in no way trying to like inhibit the use of AI, like actually quite the opposite. Like they really want to make sure that they're supporting overall business goals. They just want to um, almost give employees like comfort as to like, hey, you're totally cool if you're doing stuff over here. Just please be careful mm-hmm. of like these very specific um, things versus training that might make it appear to be like AI is very dangerous and it's a, you know, um, <laughs> it's a concern for like all data privacy issues. Therefore, like don't use it unless you've you know got approval or something. That's not what they want to do. Um, and then the last one is um, actually just very specific manager training. So um, I've, I've mm-hmm. seen a lot of interest in like how to get managers to recognize when something is an issue. I think this became much more common mm-hmm. with um, moving to like uh, uh, remote and hybrid. It's just like managers don't totally right. know like uh, if someone is kind of flagging like a reasonable accommodation, but they're not exactly using those words. Um, Or you have new managers who don't even maybe realize that they have certain responsibilities. Um, That's the last bucket. 
On the AI tools piece, or, or I, that's actually, I think, a really interesting area we put out um, last year, um, which we did in concert with some AGCs for privacy and GCs. They helped us with it. We put out a sort of template and, and um, playbook mm. around AI use policies. Yeah. What, what are you seeing on that front? Is it a lot of education about these are the tools, these are the risks. Is there even sort of like, this is what's happening with the EU AI Act and like, here's some background on that. Like, what, what are you seeing actually in market in, in terms of training today? And I mean, I'm yeah. sure that'll look different in six months. Um, yeah. <sighs> totally. Yeah. I think what I'm actually seeing is more like a desire for just a ton of specificity. So like at our <laughs> company, you are okay to use and like literally saying the tools that are like, you know, you have some sort of enterprise license or for whatever reason, your company sure. is like, I'm a marketer, like which AI tools can I use? Which ones do we, you know, how do I request a new one? Like those t- types of things. Yeah. I'm seeing less and it could just be like the conversations I'm having, not, not totally sure. I'm seeing less desire for like very general, like, you know, um, here's what mm-hmm. AI is and it's, you know, sort of like regulatory landscape and just much more like, you know, um, I am a salesperson. Am I cool to like put, you know, um, whatever our transcripts here, here and here, um, like that, Uh that kind of stuff. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I'd imagine that you're probably thinking about AI too, uh, as totally the founder of a tech company. What are ways that you're leveraging AI today, either personally or that, you know, are fitting into Athena's product roadmap? Yeah. So, um, you know, I talked a lot about like, uh, role-based training, customization, all of that. But mm-hmm. if you think about, for example, for almost all of our customers, they want some sort of language translation for all of that. And the more variables uh, you introduce. So if you have sales specific data privacy training, which is different than your HR specific data privacy training, Training, like it gets very complicated. Uh, and so um, we've been uh, leveraging AI to do a lot of the like um, speeding up language translations. Um, you know, what mm-hmm. is it? Um, uh, dubbing versus the um, sub, like th- those sorts of things. Yeah. Because when you, I-, I think, train correctly, it does mean that you have a lot of permutations of training. You might have swappable scenarios based on, again, role, seniority, or whatever. Um, and so the, um, in particular in like content creation, we're seeing a lot of opportunities to really speed up or to make like, um, hyper personalization. So, you know, you call it HR, someone else calls them people partners, someone else calls them whatever, like, great. You know, we can, we can kind of flow all yeah. of that into someone's training without, um, you know, all of the, uh, cost and, and time that would historically have been associated with that. Interesting. Um, I'm curious. I mean, and there's sort of a, a general question here too, which is, you know, um, I talk to a lot of general counsels, a lot of in-house counsel, legal operations folks too, who are thinking about when they're going to buy a tool that has an AI component. Mm. How do they make sure that that works well and they can trust the outputs? And there's maybe an element of human review, etc. Totally. I think the other sort of broad question here is. As you spun up on selling to legal and selling to HR, I think with those functions, there's a really important element of trust that's required yes. for them to be willing to commit to a tech solution. Yes. <laughs> I can tell you, you agree. Yeah, I think it's uh, like... Yeah, so, I mean, but both of those, like how, how have you learned to, learn to sell to legal and HR and, and today with AI too, right? Yeah. Like what does that look like? Yeah, I think of a very specific customer call. I was on um, where a customer was going to, um, they had our training and they were buying our hotline and case management tool and they had their legal team mm-hmm. on and they had their HR team. And I think the HR team asked some version of like, do you all, can we have AI um, categorize our issues, right? So like an employee maybe submits something or an HRVP submits something and it's like, you know, whatever, like Roxanne used her personal device inappropriately um, and uh-huh. our AI would flag that as like, I don't know, code of conduct or something. And sure. I was sitting on a call because I honestly, like, you know, if I'm being totally honest, it is challenging when you hear, uh, when you hear, you understand that your buyer really is being told they need to lean into AI, but like you and your team have done a really thoughtful review and you're like, I don't think this is a good use case of AI. So in this particular mm-hmm. example, there is a low volume of employee submitted issues. And even at a large company, HR or internal compliance related issues, like, you know, it's, it's not something that is like, um, if it is something that is such a high volume that you can't manually categorize it, that's usually like a separate uh-huh. issue of like, holy smokes, like, you know, um, what's <laughs> like, right. Like what's going on. 
Uh-huh. And so I like paused for a minute because I was like, I never want to tell somebody that we have this feature that we don't. And I was just kind of curious. And the legal um, person jumped in and was like, I do not want AI to be categorizing, uh, you know, our issues, both for like accuracy, but even concerns of like privilege and like, no, thank you. And I yeah. was all very grateful to be like, excellent. Okay, good. Because that's what we do. Like, <laughs> you know, like you categorize them. Like it is a manual, like you, you know, pick from a drop down because we have heard that, um, both like accuracy and um, and uh, the sort of legal considerations are such that like this is not an area that is a great use of AI and like we're um, maybe as like uh, hard as it can be when there's like a trend we're just going to make a stance that like this is not something that we have embedded AI into because we don't see the need for it but we do see the risks of it and like mm-hmm. that's the answer so anyway very long way of saying that like yeah like I think it's actually um, been helpful for us in building credibility in particular with legal, but with really all of our buyers to be honest about like where we don't have any plans right now to put AI into the product. Sure. Have you, that, that sort of sparks a, a separate idea for me, which is, um, well, a couple of my friends, Julia Shulman and Andy Dale, who have both been prior podcast guests or yeah. advisors, you know, they work in more of like the VC backed, small to medium sized businesses growing, yeah. right? Maybe going to go public someday or get acquired or um, have you seen really sort of distinct differences in the compliance needs or the compliance issues that are arising at that sort of size business as opposed to what I'll call like the true enterprise level, right? Like 5,000, 10,000 plus employees. Cause totally. I know you have clients across both. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like really different. Like we might be someone's first tool and all you have is an HR person, right? You don't have in-house legal, let alone in-house compliance. And then we serve, you know, huge public companies. Um, and they're really different, um, in, in terms of what they care about. The nice thing is like the product. So we've tried to think about like a product suite that scales with you. So for, um, like if you're kind of saying that, yeah, like the Andy Julia types company is like quick growing, but they're not necessarily public yet. I think some of the concerns we hear are actually things like we don't want to, um, we don't want to make legal compliance ops like um, in any way like um, in h- a hindrance to growth. And so how do we make sure that this training program doesn't feel like we just took something that's designed for like the army, you know, and like put it into <laughs> like, you know, a fast growing company because like we legal are going to just like really never hear the end of it if we suddenly have six hours of training and it feels like, why are we talking about, you know, export controls? Like, you know, what is even right. is that? Like, is that are you sure that's relevant to us? And so it's actually much more about like being really targeted and almost like parsimonious um, and feeling very lightweight. And then as a company scales, like along their compliance maturity journey, um, and they're maybe going public or something, then we hear things like, hey, we have customer contracts. And it turns out that they want us to have an employee hotline. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. And so like, how do you help us like sort of make sure that our compliance program is really up to like um, up to um, uh, snuff with all of the obligations that we have? And then at the like public company, when there's a compliance um, uh, person involved, uh, what we're seeing is then more of a focus on like audit committees, regulators, like, hey, how do we really right. demonstrate um, to these folks that we have a really thoughtful program that we can show year over year progress, that the audit logs are really like fast, clean, easy to pull. But of course, again, like going back to your 50 person company, they're like, would be like, what's an audit committee? You know, like that's not, that's yeah, not where right. we're concerned. So it really is like a really different, um, just like, you know, where they are on the compliance maturity journey. And we always try to like meet someone where they're at versus take something that's appropriate for the, you know, 50,000 employee company and, and, you know, throw that into a 75 person fast growing tech company. Before I ask you a, a few fun questions, and then I have a traditional sort of closing question that I like to ask all guests. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, what the next few years look like for for you and look like for Athena and, and what you're most excited about uh, as you continue to build and, and grow the business. Totally. Um, I mentioned this product that like is very near and dear to my heart, the hotline and case management yeah. suite. Um, yeah. And while it's like our kind of um, new addition to the to the team, I'm really excited about like um, that product interacting with our training product in terms of like the data and the richness that we can give a company, right? Like there's just only so much if we're your training tool, we can give you a really holistic piece of what your training program looks like. But when um, we also are supporting you in tracking like a variety of issues, whether again, they're more HR or their sort of code of conduct or whatever, I think we're able to do a lot of really neat things. So for example, like, oh, it seems like there's a lot of questions and concerns and issues around expense policy. 
okay, we're seeing that here. How could we like surface to you something like, hey, we've got this short three minute training. You know, when we see that people give it to their team, you know, it reduces the questions, the concerns, the issues around this. Um, I think that's Uh really exciting. Um, I think the other thing that's getting getting me very excited is just getting to work with um, larger companies, like really sophisticated compliance teams. I find that, you know, corny as it sounds, like we end up just learning so much from them, but then also being able to serve as a thought partner when a large company says like, hey, we're trying to like revamp this whole thing based on X, Y, and Z concern. Like, have you seen anyone do this well before? And now we get to be a little bit of a thought partner and saying like, okay, here's like a menu of five things that I've seen, um, you know, our customers pull from in terms of a uh, test out or, you know, adaptive learning or like whatever it is, like um, having better governance um, in terms of like what even gets to be considered mandatory training, um, which of these are you interested in? And then I can like even potentially connect you with customers like that. That has been really fun. Yeah. I mean, I think enterprise clients might get a little bit of a bad rap because they're sometimes my favorite, it's like, well, cause they're so needy, <laughs> but they're like in a good way, you know, like then they like make you be better. Yeah. Yeah. And from a compliance perspective, I mean, they're the ones who are going to be reporting up to the board, like you mentioned and have, you know, might have a committee that's totally focused on this. Even totally. besides audit committee. Um, super interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay. Some fun questions for you, hopefully fun, yes. as we start to <laughs> wrap up. Uh, the first one, I, I'm curious what you know your favorite part of your day to day is as a founder, or as a as a CEO, and, and maybe tied to that is that is that what you expected when mm. you got into it uh, too? Yeah, I mean, I think my favorite parts of my day are either whether it's customer facing or internal. Um, I really love getting challenged. So like, I think about Mm -hmm. on our team in particular who are really good at it. Like they may be like the most junior person in the meeting and they're just like, I'm going to be honest, this seems dumb. And like, here's why. (laughs) And I always just think that's so cool, you know, like to be able to keep like that maybe because in the army that was Mm -hmm. me, like, uh, you know, I always had like a thought (laughs) for like a general officer, you know, like two days into my role. Um, but I think that that's just like a really fun, exciting thing to kind of try to keep fostering a culture where there's like a healthy debate of ideas and it's not like, um, I don't know, it doesn't feel like stuffy and corporate and political in a way that like, that's just not the type of company I want to be at, let alone that I want to leave. Sure. Um, and I think that I would have found that quite predictable. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, do you have a professional pet peeve? (laughs) I do. Um, <laughs> I'm very guilty of um, this is a small one. But maybe it's fun, but um, like, man, some corporate isms are just a little bit absurd, you know, like um, boots on the yeah. ground. We're sort of like, are we like, you know, are we in a holding pattern or some stuff that in particular is from the military that I just, um, so yeah, I, I can't bring myself to say, but then others that I'm so guilty <laughs> of, you know, maybe I say circle back 12 times a day and, you know, right. we all have to live with that. That's funny. That's a good answer. Um, a couple more for you. Uh, is there a good book that you've read recently? I mean, this could be professional. It could just be for fun. Otherwise, that you might want to recommend to to the audience. Yeah, I was thinking about this, and I try to read like um, a variety, like um, nonfiction, fiction, um, all this. But yeah. um, you'd ask about Afghanistan, and so this is a real throwback. Like I read it a while ago, and it is an old book. But there's this book, The Best uh-huh. and the Brightest, that is about Vietnam. That I actually think is just hmm. like a phenomenal book. It kind of talks about like all of these um, like wonder kids um, who were young in government, sort of like Kennedy era type um, thing, and mm-hmm. how despite having these like phenomenal pedigrees. Um, and just like really being the quote, like best and the brightest of, um, American society, they just presided over like an unmitigated disaster. Um, and it's just like a really fascinating, um, read, it's like phenomenal journalist. And, um, while it is like very much the definition of an oldie, I think it's, um, it's mm-hmm. just a, a really like phenomenal book. That's a great recommendation. Um, as we start to wrap up uh, a last question for you, I like to ask this sort of thing of, of, of pretty much all of our guests. And that's, you know, if you could look back, maybe when you were first launching Athena, getting started as a founder, uh, something that you know now that you wish that you'd known back then. Yeah, it's hard because there's like a million product things that we've changed based on like, you know, but I think it's almost not fair, right? Because you have to go through the learnings to, to like get better. Um, I actually think maybe the, um, the thing that we did a good job at, but I would still like 
encourage previous me to just be even better is the like really fast, like launch and iterate and listen to customers uh, type thing. So uh, for some reason, I was actually just looking at this today. We launched our first product, like I think maybe three weeks after my co-founder and I had gotten together. It was very early because New York uh, had just rolled out these new training requirements. And I'm so glad we had like an approach like that because the training was bad. It was like not, you know, and yet um, we got, um, we got such valuable feedback from both HR leaders, from legal leaders and from employees. And I think like Mm -hmm. every time we have um, really tried to just get something very quickly in front of our customers to get their feedback, um, that's, that's just like always gotten us so much closer to the answer than really trying to like pontificate and, um, and sort of internally come up with it. And so I would sort of yeah. encourage past me to, to keep that approach, recognizing that the later, you know, the larger company you get, you have to be really thoughtful about how you, how you do that. Because of course the, mm-hmm. um, the, uh, companies we're supporting today, it's, it's really important to, um, to get things right and have, um, really high quality. But I still think that, um, going back to the enterprise customers, like, um, getting a bad rap. I mean, I think like I'll just get on a call with them and sometimes in 10 minutes, they've like blown my mind with like, here's why you should go build this thing. And like, you know, all the other competitors here, they're doing it wrong. And I'm like, like that was just the most, mm-hmm. you know, golden um, piece of insight I, I could have gotten. And I never would have gotten there if I had just sort of um, talked internally with, with my team. Cause no matter how smart they are, it's, it's not the same as uh, talking to people who really are um, really are doing it day to day. Great advice for founders everywhere. Uh, Roxanne, this has been, you have such a unique sort of journey and, and career arc. Um, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for, for joining me. Thanks for having me. And to all of our listeners, thanks for tuning in. And we hope to see you next time. 